All right, so here's two projects that have been updated, existential forgery and finding large primes. Uh, there were some corrections required here. The um, open SSL format of the command had changed a little, and I was using Python 2 instead of Python 3. So I updated this project, and also the, um, the last challenge was not working, and I fixed that. So I figured I better go through it. Uh, this is a weakness in RSA. Um, if you have an RSA signature, you can forge messages that match a certain signature. So if you want to op generate a key, it's OpenSSL Gen RSA, and you have to have the 512 there, and that generates a 512-bit um, RSA key, and it doesn't show it to you, it just creates it. But it puts it in a file, and I put it in this file, your name pkey.pem. So it's the private key, and the private key contains all the information you need. Now I see someone asking if Diffie Hellman P is different for each communication. Um, I think you that's a good question, and I don't really know. I think you I think it's not secret. I think you just sent it across. I don't think it has to be different for each communication. But I think you do have to transmit it. So my belief is you transmit it in clear text. It's a good question and be sort of nice to uh, to run one through. But I think you you agree to it. Uh, P and the base, which was H, I think, G. P and G you agree on and you transmit them and they're not secret, I think. Good. Anyway, so if you want to see the private key, you can use cat to go inside here and you'll see this base64 encoded stuff. And that stuff, there's a whole project I went through the formats, digging things out of there. Uh, but OpenSSL AS1 parse will extract what's inside there. And you get a series of numbers. And here's E. E is almost always this number, 65, 537 in base 64, or, or base 16. This is X. And this long number is N. And then these other numbers are here, N, E. This is D, the decryption key which is derived there by doing the uh, modular inverse of E. And here is P and Q, which are the ones most obviously used for the private key. Though for those two numbers, you can derive the rest, um, except you have to be given E. Anyway, so that's what these are. And these are related numbers like phi and stuff that are used that I didn't feel really important enough to label. So this is all this stuff is just packed together with some uh, formatting characters and base64, and that's what you have here as the private key. So that's the private key. But the public key, of course, does not contain all that value. The public key, you can get the public key from the private key. You will take the input from the private key, and your output will be the public key, and this dash pub out tells it what you're doing. So if you wanted to send your public key to somebody else so they could send you a message, you wouldn't send them the private key. You'd send them this thing, the public key, and that looks like this. It is much shorter, of course. And all that's in there, you can find out with this strange format. I don't know why you have to do it with the less than sign instead of dash in, but this is the version of the command that works. Now you get what's inside there, and what's in there is the exponent, 65537, and this is the modulus, and for some ungodly reason, they give it to you in base 16 with colons in the middle, which you'll have to extract when you use it. But, you know, this probably made sense decades ago when they wrote this stuff. Anyway, that is the um, N, and that is E. And we should be able to see the N up here. This number up here, CFE, I think it was N. Yeah, I'm not seeing a close relationship. Oh, yeah, this is base 64. No, that's base 16. DCA and CFE. Oh, it's this one. The first number was N. DCA 13F. And here it is, DCA13F. It's just formatted differently for some cruel reason. But anyway, that's all you're giving them is N and E in its standard format. So now if you want to make a public signature, I have a message. And the message is X. And I calculate the signature by taking X to the private key mod N. And since I... Um, I'm basically encrypting it with my private key, and anybody who wants to verify the signature can decrypt it with my public key. E is the public, E and N are the public key. So 
if I make take a message here, let's do this stuff. All right. So thou, that's a starts Python. Here I have a message where I just put in any kind of text and I make it a byte stream. Then I uh, convert it into hex. So it looks like this. And there's the length of it. So that is my original message, 38 characters of hex. Now I'm going to sign it. So I take N and E and D, which are numbers I got from that uh, uh, previously generated public key, and I just raise it to that power. So I take X to the D mod N. And all I have to do is a couple of translations to move things into the right format. So that mess is the signature, 906 and all that jazz. So I can send somebody this message, which is not encrypted, and this signature, and anybody can take my public key and verify that I am the person that wrote that message. And they do it this way. They take the signature to the E mod N, and that gives them an X. They convert X to hexadecimal, and these are ASCII characters, 48656C, and when you print them out, that way it'll turn back into hello from your name. So that's the game. Um, they see this message in plain text, and they can take the signature in my known public key and reproduce the plain text, and that proves that I signed it and that it has not been altered since I signed it. So that is how you would do things like sign an email with RSA. Now, you can form the existential forgery attack. If I want to, I can choose a signature and calculate a message from the signature this way. And then I will have a message which will match the signature. It will be gibberish because I don't have the ability to choose an arbitrary message, but I can do that. I can make a signature of just the byte F and then I can um, take the byte F, I can take S to the E mod N and that gives me my X, which I convert into hex. So this is now the message which is correctly signed by that signature. So I can send somebody this message and that signature, and if they're running it through an automated process, they will conclude that I must have the private key because I made a valid signature for that message. What they don't know is I just forged it. The penalty is, of course, that the message is just gibberish. If you print it out, it's just unprintable characters here, looking like dirt, and I use stars for unprintable characters, why there's so many stars there. It's just gibberish, but if you're going to an automated process, it might conclude that I must have the private key because I was able to create a properly signed message. That's why this naked RSA is not a very secure protocol, because you can do this existential forgery attack. All right, so here's a public key, You can, and you have project is you have to extract the necessary parameters N and E, and then create a message that is signed. So you make a signature with your name and then sign it like this. And when these two match, you'll get a key, you'll get a, uh, uh, a flag. And down here is the same thing, but you have to now correctly sign a message and the message has to start with ABC. Now, remember I said, when you do this, you create random gibberish for the message. So what you'll have to do is make a loop and try thousands and thousands of keys of thousands and thousands of signature values until you find a signature value that just happens to create a message you like. And uh, it took me maybe two, three minutes of calculation to do it. So I make a message that starts with ABC and then has gibberish after that. So that's the uh, existential forgery attack. And the other one is pretty simple, is finding large primes. We talked about how you have to keep finding these primes and the way you do it is there is a theorem Fermat's little theorem, and um, you can just test this condition, where if you have a to p minus 1, it should be 1. So what we do here is you put in a number you think might be prime, and then I just choose random values of a, and I see if a to the p minus 1 mod p is 1. That would be true if p is prime, but if p is not prime, it has a high chance of not being true. So this thing here, um, I think I've got it in this directory. Let's see, Fermat. Yeah, so if I do Python 3 Fermat, all right, if I put in 11, it picks some random numbers and it passed, 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 passed. It passed, it shows the same random number a few times, which is kind of uh, sloppy, but that's the way it is. 
It didn't pass every time I did it. If I give it a larger random prime number like 29, you see it passes five times, which is pretty good. If I give it a number that's not prime, like 100, then you see it fails. And if I give it, say, 121, it fails. So it's a pretty good test. It's not perfect, but if you run this some number of times, it's pretty likely to, you get five passes, it's very likely to be a prime number. And that's how you do it. It is a probabilistic process. So you can test even ridiculously long numbers here. I don't even need to write another program for this. I can run the same program and put in that 1024-bit number. And it tries it quickly. And so I got a pass, another pass, another pass, pass, pass. I got five passes. So it's prime. Uh, not perfect equals false negative or false positive. Well, it has, I think it has both properties. There are certain um, numbers that are not prime that will pass. And it has both of those flaws. That's why this is not considered a perfect test. Although I think in RSA, uh, what I've read is you can guess numbers this way, and then after they pass this test, you try encrypting a message and decrypting it. And if that works, that proves it really was prime. I think that's what's actually done. Also, there are some more complicated statistical tests that have a smaller number of false positives and false negatives. But um, you know, this is the simplest one. Anyway, um, so now you can find prime numbers. So for find the first prime bigger than 10 to the 300, which sounds ridiculous, but in fact, it's not that hard to do in Python. It doesn't take that long. And then find the next companion prime over 10 to the 100. Companion primes are two sequential numbers that are prime. Of course, they can't be exactly sequential because then one of them would be even. They have to be apart by two, like five and seven are both prime. So that's companion primes. And 11 and 13 are both primes. They're companion primes. But 13 and 15 are not both prime. 15 is 3 times 5. So companion primes are much rarer than individual primes, but they're still not that rare. And I was able to find it here. I think I had to try about a million guesses to find one, and that didn't take too long. So there's a few more mathematically oriented projects to do. And I guess that's enough for this video.